Um, Dee Dee's going to take it up from here to talk about how other things are having communications on the landscape. So, and then we'll be a moment for questions after that. Thanks, Cheryl, and, and thanks, Gordy. Um, so this is really part two of a continuing talk of how we might be integrating uh, the aquatic with the terrestrial. And um, I will be talking more about those headwater systems that Gordy alluded to. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank Brett for this map. Um, <laughs> So um, most of my work has been done on the west side of Oregon and Washington, so that's where I'll be coming from from most of my examples today. Um, and so this is a watershed from the Cascade Range on the west side, um, but these headwaters really predominate on the watersheds of, of the west side forest. They're highly dissected. You can see the crenulations if you look at landscape photos. Um, or topo maps, and in fact, they can make up up to 80% of the stream length of a watershed, so they can be quite dominant in terms of where the water is as well. So keep that in mind, because that'll come in several places as we go along. Whoops. Um, so, so many species are associated with the aquatic systems, and we, t we learned about some fish aspects just now from Gordy. Um, in a minute, I'll be focusing more on the amphibians, but once the riparian reserves are out on the landscape, they can provide incidental benefits for a host of taxa. Um, and and um, assessment of the late successional and old growth species um, in the Northwest forest came up with it at least 100 uh, species that were thought to have incidental benefits of riparian reserves once they were out on the landscape. And that included lichens and bryophytes, mollusks, the whole gamut um, through owls and, and red tree voles. Um, so keep that in mind. I will talk probably mostly about amphibians as we go along, but these are examples that could apply to a lot of species, especially the low mobility species that aren't moving fast across the landscape. Um, once you create this habitat, they can be highly useful for a lot of species. And as movements occur along riparian areas, um, there can be a funneling. And uh, we don't know for most species, are they moving upstream or downstream, but even stochastic movements, they will be moving across that entire network and into the headwaters eventually. So key considerations as you're looking at this as a whole, we've, we've learned uh, from the fish perspective that um, there are headwater benefits for a lot of fish. So downwind recruitment can come from headwaters as well as stream side areas throughout the network. Um, there are landslide prone areas that are in headwaters. Um, there is a signature of where cold water uh, systems, uh, where the groundwater comes in from headwaters. Um, there's fish intrinsic potential that links the stream to the upland conditions throughout the network. And we saw that left side of Gordy's map with the yellow tinge. Those were the intrinsic potential areas for um, for salmonids there, and something that hasn't been mentioned is that there are significant prey inputs for downstream fish from headwaters. So now focusing on what happens more specifically in headwaters, <clears throat> there are headwater associated species, there are riparian associated species, and now once you have this riparian reserve network on the landscape, um, essentially it becomes a road network for a lot of species. It's like I-5 corridor. Um, and uh, think of it as a connectivity um, dispersal habitat. So habitat is where organisms are having their reproduction, where they're foraging, but it's also dispersal. And dispersal across the landscape might be a very important element of this uh, riparian reserve network once it's laid out on the landscape. <clears throat> so I'm going to focus on some amphibian examples as we go through here. And in headwaters, there are a ton of amphibians. Well, a ton. There's um, about 30 in the northwest, and they mostly have riparian associations, and many of them have headwater associations. So here's an example of some endemic species. You've got four species of giant salamanders, four species of torrent salamanders. Um, 
two species of tailed frogs and a couple species of plethodonted salamanders that are highly associated with seeps or bank areas, wet areas. So these are the ones really aquatic or semi-aquatic amphibians. And then you have others that occur in those headwater drainages. So you have the perennial stream associated assemblage, an intermittent stream associated assemblage, a bank assemblage, and then an upland assemblage of amphibians that are highly associated with downwood and rocky substrates, cool, uh, wet microhabitats. So um, it gets more complicated, right? You have more than just fish in the landscape. These are um, endemic species to the northwest. They don't occur elsewhere. Um, some of them are trending towards listing. On the left here, we have the torrent salamander. There's four species of torrent salamanders. They are highly associated with intermittent streams in the uppermost headwaters. Two of them are proposed for T&E listing under ESA right now. So I'm going to give um, three examples of how I think about landscapes and incorporating these types of organisms into the picture. Really you have a, a puzzle that you're putting together and you're starting to accumulate a lot of puzzle pieces to this puzzle. But let's go through each one, one by one, and then you get the whole picture. And it's kind of how we, we work in landscapes. There are a lot of considerations as you go through, but put them together one by one and it's not overwhelming. So my first example will be with giant salamanders, and this is work that's ongoing. It's a genetic study across the coast range of Oregon. Um, we sampled uh, tail tips of giant salamanders in these clusters, and actually they're um, located, let me show you, here's B. These uh, were, sites were not chosen at random. They are in headwaters, and B happens to be Mary's Peak, which is where three different watersheds come together. The Willamette River drains the east side, the Sayusla River drains the southwest side, and the Yaquina River drains the north side. So these are three distinct watersheds, and we sampled the giant salamanders there to see if there is connectivity across these different drainages for one. And then um, a north-south distribution of these clusters to see what the genetic pattern was and if, can we get some insights to their movement across the landscape. This study is still going on, so we're still working on it, but the early results are very intriguing. First off, um, we're not seeing any land cover type predictors of the dispersal for this species. So for example, forest cover does not seem to be related to um, the genetics of this animal. And you can do um, circuit theory, for example, circuit, uh, electrical circuit sort of analysis to see how the genes are flowing through the landscape. So we're not seeing any landscape predictors of giant salamander movement, but we did see a pretty strong um, south to north signature of the genetics suggesting this animal is not moving very fast and it's still chasing the glacier, glacial retreat from thousands of years ago. Um, so they are moving, but very slowly as you go north, there's less and less genetic heterogeneity. It's like that founder effect. We can still see it in those northern populations. So there's a lesson there. These animals are moving, but not fast. So making persistent habitat um, across the landscape would be a consideration. Um, secondly, inside these clusters that we were looking at, about 20% showed a bottleneck. So there was quite a lot of um, commonality in the genes within the cluster showing that they were moving between those watersheds quite freely, but one in five of those populations had a bottleneck. That means it blinked out recently, which is supportive of a metapopulation structure where some populations stochastically, or, or maybe there's a disturbance event, um, blink out and then eventually it gets recolonized. But this process seems to be very slow for giant salamanders because we can see that signature of a bottleneck. So this leads me to, if you're going to have connections across the landscape, you need redundant connections because just 
by either the inherent stochasticity of those populations or a disturbance event is causing one in five to blink out in the headwater. We've looked at the, um, what's happening at the landscape. It doesn't seem to be anything that we can see with um, fire signature or land management or land use. It could be landslide potential blinking out these headwaters and that would um, sync with what Gordy was talking about with landslide prone areas. This work is still going on, but we're learning some things about how we might think about landscapes, redundant connections, um, and uh, you know, just don't put one connection out there, but multiple connections and think about how watersheds are united and get those connections across distinct watersheds. So we did this with the torrent salamanders also, and this, this work is published um, just recently. We did uh, two torrent salamanders in the coast range, again looking at their genetics across the landscape. And for torrent salamanders, we saw a very strong signature of forest cover uh, as an, a predictor of their genetic uh, connectivity. So dispersal was highly related to forest cover. So for this species, um, which is a headwater associated species, the, the bottom line is that think about retaining forest cover for those over ridge connections. And that's what we were looking at in this study is how do these animals move across the entire landscape and forest was necessary. Third example, this one, I have a, a few more slides because it um, has several steps to go through it. This one just came out yesterday. Yes, yay. Um, we were interested in headwater stream flow um, and was there an effect of forest management on that? or an effect of climate. And what prompted this study is that um, we've been doing a long-term riparian management study since 94, and we've seen dry years, and we've seen wet years, and we had an anecdotal observation that there was less stream flow in dry years. So that prompted us to do a retrospective study across many years, looking at how the streams were flowing in dry years and wet years. Um, and overlay forest management on that. Um, and uh, here's what we came up with. Our hypothesis was, um, is there a shrinking headwaters going on, either because of forest management or because of climate? Um, in short, I'll call that shrinking heads, just because I like to say that word. Um. <laughs> And um, the consequence, again, with um, Brett's map as the template, is if the headwaters are shrinking, that has consequences for this over ridge dispersal. And I, I will give you evidence in a minute that you need to be thinking of the dark blue, the perennial streams for these connections, not the headwaters that might be intermittent. So, but let me get there in a minute. Um, this was a study that we used, a retrospective study from Western Oregon where we have density management study sites, mostly on BLMs across the west uh, portion of the state. And our riparian buffer designs, the landscape management part is um, intact buffers with thinning upland. And our sites have gone through two thinnings. Um, a young managed stand was our beginning, and then, and we have controls um, that still look like this. Um, a first thinning, and then a second thinning. And we use data from across this time frame um, in our analysis. So stepping you through the different analyses. So we took only discontinuous streams for this analysis. So these are the uppermost headwaters that are spatially intermittent. They're on the surface and they go under, on the surface again and they go under. And we looked to see how those spatially intermittent streams, how the surface stream flow changed over time. 65 reaches, a 16 year time span. Um, first we wanted to see which, was, which stream flow metric would be the best thing to characterize this, this surface stream flow. Um, and through an ordination analysis, we looked at um, 27 metrics and decided that the percent dry channel length was the best metric to um, explain variation in stream flow. So moving forward with percent dry channel in these headwaters, 
We looked to see if that was a function of climate metrics, land management, which was buffers with thinning, and the basin area. For climate, we looked at 22 climate variables, and there was a handful of those that were highly associated with um, percent dry channel. So we put those into a multivariate model, and the answer was that percent dry length was positively related to two climate metrics and to basin area, but the land management signature had nothing to do with percent dry channel length. So the management fell out of the equation. Uh, two climate factors were important, and the basin area was important, which makes sense. If you have a larger basin, you have more um, opportunity for water to be accumulated, and you have perennial flow. So there were two climate metrics, so we thought, yay, let's do a forward projection with scenarios of climate change and see what happens. <clears throat> And then we do a landscape projection of that to see what happens with um, habitat for things like torrent salamanders. So here's our climate change projection. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty, but we took three scenarios over three time periods. In the latest time period, 2085, the range of effect of, across all those scenarios was um, a 7 to 11 percent increase in dry length. If you look at the y-axis, that range is getting toward half of the stream channel becoming dry into the future. So that piles on to what we already have going on right now. So we have increasing shrieking heads with time. And we did a landscape projection. Just in, in part of this landscape, we used the range of the Cascade Torrent Salamander. Um, and we chose this one because it is being uh, petitioned for ESA listing, so it, it has some relevance today. Um, and we had a pretty good dot map of where it occurred. <laughs> And so our process here was to model the streams in the watersheds where this animal occurs using NetMap. So we have a stream layer. And then we assessed the stream lengths in first order streams and in small drainage streams. So our model really pointed to small basins being um, important for percent dry channels. So that might be a, a better metric to use, but we weren't sure first order streams might um, also be relevant in this context. And we calculated this further reduction um, from our, our future projection with climate change, and we summed up how many stream miles would be lost. So if, if you're thinking of first order streams into the future in 2085, between 800 and 1,200 miles of stream get lost in that landscape. Um, and if you're thinking of small basins, less than 12 hectare, um, it's a little bit less. So between about 600 and 950 miles lost. So what does that mean? Um, well, we're concerned because this is a very small salamander. Its legs are like a centimeter. Um, and we're talking about miles of habitat being lost. It's likely reproductive habitat, foraging habitat, and dispersal habitat altogether. But the bottom line is, instead of thinking of those intermittent streams as the points of departure for overridge connections, think of the perennial streams. So as you're connecting across watersheds, maybe the riparian reserve network, think of where the perennial water is today as your jumping off point, and use that as you're connecting over. So, um, so I've been talking about the why now of brown cow. There are some reasons why you might have connections across the landscape. Now I'm going to go into how now, how you might do that. So the left is a density management study site that shows some examples of how riparian areas can connect across the landscape. This is a BLM square, and here's a stream connecting across the diagonal. So you have a riparian buffer doing that connectivity. Here is um, a plot that has been thinned, and you can see the stream coming up. Well, there's leave islands and thinning, and so those also can be mechanisms for providing connectivity. 
Leave islands um, can provide interior habitat, especially if they're an acre in size, for example. Um, thinning provides some overstory cover, um, and ground structures may also be important. So in this schematic, you see some down wood providing ground structures, microclimate, microhabitat on the ground. Ground structures with trees, better. So here's some ideas. Also, tree tipping provides that wood. Um, also, you have possibly a benefit for the stream if you trip, tip it toward the stream. <clears throat> In a landscape, you might have a landscape that is um, cookie cuttered. Think of the corners as opportunities if you have the checkerboard landscape. Um, and so you can have your um, your tree retention or downwood structures from the stream up through the corners, that helps. So here's that schematically. Your landscape may not be quite so perfectly structured, so think of how you might do that in your odd landscape of different types of polygons. Again, from the perennial stream of one watershed over to a perennial stream of another. Here are some watersheds along the coast. Um, I put some red dots here at the, the corner of where there might be opportunities to go to different landscapes. In contrast to what Gordy was suggesting, um, where you might divide a half of a landscape and have um, you know, a, a conservation area and a management area, well, I would suggest that you also think of providing connection, multiple connections in a north-south direction and an east-west for things like fire. We don't know where natural disturbance is going to hit, but mul multiple connections is also needed. And maybe you can do that as you start laying these pieces together with um, areas that are important for stream temperature and for species. You get multiple um, areas that you might be considering at the landscape view. So the edge, the sub-watersheds at the edge of larger watersheds may be important to provide that connectivity over to the next drainage. These animals that I study, the amphibians, they're not going downstream to the ocean and coming back up. They need to go up and over the sideways. So think of those, those edge watersheds might be priority areas. You can't necessarily have connectivity everywhere. Here in the coast range is where three fourth field watersheds come together, and there's not that many of them. So that might be a place where you could have a three-way connection across three big watersheds, being efficient. So putting it all together, um, I think Neil Chartier from the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, um, and he and I were talking earlier this year and came up with this um, plan for the middle wind watershed and hopefully it'll expand to the upper wind that they're um, developing a management plan for now as well. But let me go through each element. We have triangles showing triads, those three different watersheds coming together. <clears throat> we have circles where there's other watershed boundaries. Brown is where owls are and so connecting to owl cores is another notion within a watershed. And you can see we don't have dots everywhere, but here are a template of priority areas within a watershed as you're doing management planning in your own unit. So in summary, heed the head, headwaters become important. Um, stream corridors might be used not just by amphibians but by many species. Um, but there are unique species that have complex life histories that need the water and the land. Um, aquatic macroinvertebrates um, also would be like that. Uh, think about connectivity between the water and the land. Forest cover may be important and that may um, have um, um, meaning for microclimates, moist, cool areas. Um, where? Well, think from perennial streams over ridge lines. Redundant connections, we learned that one from the giant salamanders. And use existing refugia as they are available. So anchor your network with what you already have. So it's a it's a case by case study. You have to look to see what you're working with before you start and do this at a larger landscape level. So thank you for everybody that contributed to the work here. And um, do I have any time for questions? One. One question, and then I'll be here at lunch. So yes. Um, 
So that's a great question. Did I include any soil, um, geography, or topography? Soil, no. That would be great to add. Um, topography, yes, and, and uh, geog what's the? geology. geology. Um, in the, in the first one where the giant salamanders were groping right now to try to explain why um, one in five populations has a bottleneck. So we are starting to look at geology next because we haven't found an answer yet. Um, but um, not as much geology. Uh, we've been looking mostly at the, is there a signature of forest management? Yeah, yeah. I'll be around at lunch. Thank you.